Hello, uh, welcome back to um, the next lecture in this series of operating systems um, kind of stuff, low level computing. Um, I'm going to carry on from where I left off in the last lecture, so if you remember in the last lecture I talked about um, how the computer boots and um, we looked at um, how we could, by using a hex editor, we could write bytes directly into a file and then use that as um, a sector on a hard disk or a DVD to boot the computer and to run that low-level code. Um, well, just to clarify one thing that I, I don't think I mentioned last time, um, you mustn't mistake reading sectors from a disk with reading files from a disk. So at the lowest level, the way the disk gets accessed by the machine is by um, it just indexes sectors, so it says I want sector 0, I want sector 1, 2, 3, 4, and it pulls a whole chunk of bytes off. Um, so that's at a low level. And then at a high level in the operating system, people develop file systems, and a file system is just really it's a simplified way of looking at it. It's just a, another indexing system for the data on the disk. So when I want to load a file from the disk in, say, my Windows or my Linux operating system, I open the file and what that means is it, the name of the file and the directory that it's in will map onto a sequence of sectors on the disk and that have the file's contents in and the, the file system that I'm using, whether that's NTFS in Windows or EXT in Linux, whatever it is, it'll have some mapping to the sectors and it'll read those off. But this happens at a very high level really um, and we're working below that at the machine level. So when I talk about writing a boot sector to the disk, I mean we actually write um, a chunk of bytes directly to the disk. Okay, there's no file system involved. It's just we, we we just view the disk at a low level as a sequence of sectors, and the boot sector is the first sector. Okay, so um, in that last lecture, I was editing the boot sector in hex, but I showed that we could create something. We could create a, an endless loop by putting the um, the machine codes in there, and and those bytes that we typed in. Um, meant something specific to the architecture that we're using, which is x86, which is a very, it's probably the most widely used computer architecture. Um, so we typed those things in, we padded out the boot sector to 512 bytes long, and we put the magic number at the end, so that the, the BIOS in the computer, when it starts up, it knows that this is code that it can run, rather than just data on a disk. So it knows it's a boot sector. So it was quite tedious to write that in a hex editor. Um, the problem is, well, it's tedious to do that, but also, if we want to write a program, we've got to learn um, all of the machine code, opcodes, for the things we want to do. If we want to, you know, move data around between registers, I'll talk about registers today, um, and all of those things, then we need to learn what all the opcodes are. So this is why we often use an assembler. And the assembler, um, you type in it's not really high level because you're still writing very low level machine codes um, but you can use names like um, you can name the registers, you can name the instructions like jump um, to compare values you can use the comp function and the assembler um, literally just translates those into machine code so it's quite a simple process really, it's just a case of the assembler looking up a table of what those um, assembly instructions are and mapping them to machine code and then it creates the boot block, just like we did in our hex editor. So I'm going to try and show that to you with some examples now. Um, yeah, so that's what we're going to do. Today we're, we're going to look at um, assembling some code for our boot sector. Um, and then we're going to learn about registers and interrupts. And using those, we're going to demonstrate how we can tell BIOS to print um, a character to the screen. Um, and that you know, that's, that's quite a good thing, because then we're learning more about the computer. Um, interrupts and registers and BIOS are fundamental to um, understanding the boot process and, you know, how a computer starts. Um, once we understand these things, we can build up and learn more about assembly and more about the computer. But we'll just start like this. Um, OK, so by the end of this, what we should have is um, a little assembly boot sector program that just says hello world, and um, we can run that we can boot a computer with that and um, our code is running at the lowest level then so it's an, a nice result okay so well where do we start let's look at assembly then so what i'm going to do now is in the last lecture when i wrote um, raw hex code in my hex editor i'm now going to 
do the same thing but using an assembler to write the code and that will transfer into my boot sector and we can look at that in a hex edit to see how it you know how it relates to what we did before so well first of all I'm going to edit a file um, called my boot sector so if I go Call it boot sector. Boot sector.asm. So this is going to be my assembly source file. Okay. Now, well, this is my assembly code now. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do some. I'm going to play around with the assembly instructions and then I'm going to compile those with my assembler. I'm using a thing called NASIM, which is quite a popular um, assembler. Uh, there's not really much difference between assemblers, they just take the, the sort of more human friendly view of the machine code instructions and translate them into opcodes. And there are slight variances between them, but they pretty much do the same thing. NASIM is quite a nice one to use, I find. Um, so it's open source as well, all this stuff is free. So, what we're going to do? Well, let's just start off with an instruction. So, um, I'm going to do this thing here. If I put this loop, okay. Now, this bit of assembly, all it means is I've declared a label here, um, which is just really a human-friendly um, mapping to an offset within my assembly code. I'm going to show you the hex so this will become clearer. But then I've got this jump and it's saying jump loop. So what this will translate to when I compile it is because this label is right at the top of my file and um, at the first instruction it's going to be zero. So this is going to say jump zero. It's going to jump to itself. We're going to get an endless loop. So um, if I just compile that or assemble it want to use the right terms. Um, I'm going to use this command here. So this is NASIM and what it's doing is taking the assembly file that I just wrote here, this one, and it's um, going to output the machine code in this file. I've just called it .bin and I've called my source.asm. It doesn't really matter what the extension is. We just need to know that this is my assembly code and this is my binary code um, that will become my boot sector. So these are just raw bytes that are going to go straight to the disk on the machine and they're going to be loaded by BIOS and interpreted as code um, when it starts running. So I've got this option here, sbin. Now really this just means that when it's just telling the assembly that I just want a raw machine code file, I don't want any metadata in there or anything like that. Um, if we were running, if we were compiling um, a program in assembly to run an operating system, then often you have lots of extra metadata in there to tell the operating system how to load the file, and you have different sections, um, some for data, some for text, things like that. So by putting fbin in there, I'm just saying take my assembly and compile it just to raw bytes, no metadata in there, just the raw, just just translate it directly to the raw program. Okay, so I'm going to run that it's very quick. It, it's very fast because it doesn't really do much. It just translates the names into code. And um, so now I've got my boot sector. So the first thing I'll do is just open it up in a in a hex editor. So I'm going to look at g-hex again. like I did in the last lecture. So I'm editing my file. Okay, what do I see? Well, all I can see in here is, is two bytes. Um, and it just, it's these numbers here. So E, B and F, E. So these are hexadecimal numbers. And, um, well, why is that then? These are just, the assembler has just translated my jump instruction into these two byte codes. So that's all it's done. It just mapped them into the machine code instructions. Um, 
Now if I tried to load this as a boot sector on the um, on, on a computer now, it's not going to run because it's first of all it's not 500, 512 bytes long um, and it's not got the magic number at the end so I need to figure out how to do that in my assembly code. So I'm going to show you how to do that now. Um, but that's it, that's a jump instruction in hex. So remember the computer, it just understands it just understands numbers, it doesn't even when I type jump, it doesn't know what jump is, it just knows what an opcode for the jump is. And this is all processor specific. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll reference more of this stuff later on, but you can get the um, like the Intel um, x86 developer manual, and you can look at all the opcodes and look at all of the different um, features available for the processor. But we can do that later. So. Okay, so we've compiled some code. Let's play around with some other things then. So I've just put a jump instruction in there. It's quite a nice one to start with. And um, we can put comments like this. If I put a comment, um, oh, we can put them here, another comment. So these just get ignored um, when it compiles it. Um, now, I mentioned before in the last lecture that the computer doesn't really differentiate between code and data. Um, if you if you start the processor executing at a certain address in memory, it's going to assume that it's code. It's going to try and execute it. And and if you if you jump the code, then it will run the code. If you jump into data, then it will interpret that data, so those bytes as opcodes, and then try and run them. Often, when you end up accidentally jumping into some data, um, it often happens when you get memory errors in C. Um, and you end up jumping into some data and you can start executing that data and use a little crash because it, it's meaningless. There's no there's no real logic or sense to the opcodes that it's interpreting. So there's no difference between code and data at the low level. Um, but often in programs we need to declare data, we need to declare strings, um, default values, stuff like that. So the same with this assembly, we can declare data in it. We've just got to make sure at this low level that we don't allow the um, the computer to start executing that data. Um, but as I work through this, we'll see what that means. But if I put db zero here, um, what this means is it's, it means a data byte. It just means it's not a it's not it's not um an instruction like jump or move or something like that. It's just saying stick a zero directly into the output, um, the binary output. Um, so let's see what happens when I run that. So I've just I compiled it again and I'm just going to edit it. There we go, so we've just got a zero on the end. So an extra byte added. So now we've got three bytes in our, in our boot sector. Let's put another one on there. So if I do db, I don't know, let's put one. And we run it. It's often nice to um, play around with things like this to really understand how the assembly is working so that you don't like just assume things are just magic. You can just play around with little examples, you know, see what code it generates and then, um, you know, and then you can really understand how it's working. Sometimes when you see tutorials and tutorials and things they just talk about you know here's some opcode and stuff here's some assembly but they don't really encourage you to look at you know to just just try you know compiling simple things and looking at what the output's like it's often very useful to do that in C and we'll do that later on we'll take C code and we'll compile it and look at what that looks like in assembly and to understand how C works it's a really nice way of learning so that you don't miss anything out. So now I added that db1 and I've got um, four bytes now. So I've got the zero to look at my code. Um, yeah, so this jump statement, jump loop, this translates to these two bytes here, which are op codes for the jump statement to jump to itself. Um, and we've got db0, which creates a byte here, and db1, which creates a byte here called one. Okay, that's good. So let's just um, do declare some more data. Now, if I do DW um, and I do one, two, three, four, 
this is declaring a word, and a word is um, well. In this case, it's it's um, I've got db0, db1, and I've got so these are bytes. These are single bytes, and a word is just two bytes. Okay, so it's just 16 bits. So um, when I compile this, I should see two more bytes added to the end. it and I edit it. There we go. So now I've got two more bytes. Because I declared a word which is two bytes, it's a 16-bit value. Um, but you'll notice the first thing that's important, if I bring this up, I declared this value, um, this 16-bit value, 1234. And if we look in here, we'll see that it's actually the way it's written to the file is in reverse order. So it's 34, so it's the, the least significant byte first and then it's 1, 2, the most significant byte last. So this is because um, x86 processors, they are um, little endian, which just means, and I always get them mixed up when I think about it, it doesn't really matter just to understand what that means and to understand which, on, on whichever process you're working, how that translates to how things are stored in memory. But yeah, so this is, this means if I declare um, a multi-byte um, type, value so here I've got 16 bits two bytes it will always get represented in memory in reverse order so and on disk as well so there we go um, now if we want to um, we want to make sure that our boot sector is 512 bytes long and then put the magic number at the end so first of all let's do the magic number so um, if you remember from the last Um, lecture. Um, the magic number was, well, we put in our code, we put this, didn't we? If I just compile this and look at it. Um, so there we've got AA55. Um, actually, um, it should have been the other way around. It should have been 55AA. And I sort of did that on purpose, really. Because because it's little endian and we've got to get them right way around, the actual 16-bit magic value is this, AA55. And that's right, so this is starting to look like our other boot sector, so we had this magic number at the end. And this magic number is important so that the BIOS, when it loads the sector, it, it decides that it's um, code that it can execute, otherwise it will skip past it and look for another drive to boot from. So that's good. But now we've got to pad it out so that this, this magic number comes at the, the end of the 512 byte block. So we can do that by adding it with these data statements like this. So I could put a whole lot of these in. Um, I can compile it and edit it. There we go, I've got some more in. So I've got to make sure I've got enough in to make it 512 bytes long. So, um, well, let's think there. We've got two bytes there. We've got two bytes there. We've got to make sure it's 512 long. So if we add um, 512, 508, I think, um, then it should make it the right length. So 508, let's say. I'm purposely doing it like this so we start to understand how the assembly works. Um, so, if some of you have done this before, you might find it a bit slow. If you've not, then hopefully you'll find it useful. And we will get into some quite heavy stuff later on, so it's, it's good to take our time now. So, I want to make sure there's 512 bytes in the sector, so I think I said if I, if I have 508 of these, then it should make it the right size. Now, we can. there's a little shortcut here where I can say times 508, and that just means duplicate this db0 508 times when it comes to compiling this. So let's see what happens. There we go, we've got lots more zeros now. And then um, that looks, have I, is that right? That's not quite right, is it? Um, it's just, so we should be, oh no, that's, 
So this is why I'm going to show you how to let the assembler calculate this for us. But yeah, we see that if we if we can put loads of those um, zeros in, we can pad it out and we'll get um, a boot sector of the right size. If I just close this, one way I can check the length of it as well is if I just do, um, I can use LS. So it's 512, so that's right, so it should boot now. Um, so let's see what happens. So I've got um, my jump, my endless loop, and I've padded out. I've got the magic number on the end, so we should be able to run this. I'm going to use it in QMU, which is a, a, a computer simulator, an XX6 simulator. I could write it to an ISO file like I did last time and run it in virtual machine. But it's often easier to work with emulators when you're doing this stuff. So let's just run this. So it says it's booting and it's gone into that endless loop. Um, let me just show you what happens if I get my code slightly wrong. So if I put 500 and I don't know, if it wasn't quite long enough. Um, I compile it. Um, and let's try to run it. There we go, look. So because I've not padded it out and the magic number's not in the right place right at the end of the first sector, then the machine doesn't know, it doesn't see it as being bootable, so it just carries on looking for other things. It's looking for, it's trying to um, look for a network boot drive because there's no hard disk, uh, there's no CD in there that can be bootable. So this is good, okay, so we, we're writing our boot sector in assembly now, which is much easier than working with um, hex. So another thing we can do here, which is often useful, if I, um, so if that was 508, if I add some more stuff in here, like, I don't know, let's put another um, jump statement in there, jump. This can also jump back to loop, it doesn't really matter. It's never going to get reached. But um, if I run this now, compile this, and then I run it, oh, it's not bootable again. And why is that? It's because my I'm adding too many zeros now because my machine code instructions is going to be it's got this extra jump in so it's made it longer. Let me just um, look at the hex for that code. So here we see we've got our two jumps here that are both the same. Um, but look, we've gone over the boot sector size, 512 bytes. So the magic number is no longer aligned at the end. It goes past it. So. One thing that you often see when you see some assembly code is the use of um, these little, well, they're sort of like placeholders, but um, if I, um, just to explain this, what I'm going to do is put some of these things into my code. So if I say DB and then put this dollar sign, a few of these in just to show you how this works. Okay, what this means, I put a dollar sign, is it means just in when it's right in the machine code, just put the the location, the offset of the current um, instruction into the machine code. So um, the the offset of this one is is one more than the offset of this one. So you can see this will increase. Um, easiest ways to compile this to see what it does. Okay, so we see there, two, three, four, five. So this is actually the offset in the, the binary file of that instruction. So it's that will be not, that will be one, this will be two, three, four. So why is this useful? Well, something else we also are going to use is another one of these special assembly symbols is this one. So a double dollar sign. If I compile that and then look at the hex again, um, oh, well, it's a bit difficult to see this because these are all zeros, but actually that um, was zero. Um, if I put more of these in, I'll just put this one at the end so you can see differentiate between the zeros so so I'm going to put a 1, 2 in there this will become clearer soon 
so okay that double dollar sign is just put zeros in here and um, basically what the dollar signs do is the, the single dollar sign is the current offset in the um, file and um, the current byte so this would be the address of this instruction the offset from the start of the the, um, the binary data and this would be the next one this would be the next one but do double dollar sign just refers to the um, the origin um, in this case it's just zero but we'll see that that we can change that later on anyway what this means is that if we write something like this if we want to make sure that our boot sector is always padded to 512 bytes then we can say um, 510 because the last two bytes of the 512 bytes are occupied by the magic number this 16 bit number here so we want to pad it with zeros all the way up to there with 510 to make sure that this 510 bytes before this last byte so we can do this using those dollar signs that we saw so this is just saying um because this is zero it's just saying take 512 510 minus the offset of this instruction here um, and and that's the number of times we want to write zeros into a file so let's just do that there we go so it's padded to 512 bytes and um, if I had some more stuff in here, um, db um, one two db I don't know whatever it doesn't matter. Another one we can do is we can fill it with a string as well. Um, this just all this means is it, it it just writes the ASCII values of this directly into the um, into the output. Um, but what I've done there, so I've added some more stuff, so it means that um, hopefully it should still be 512 bytes long because um, this accounts for the relative offset of this instruction when it pads it out. You never really have to worry about this stuff, I'm just trying to explain it so you know how it works and what those things mean when you see them in code. Because often you see something weird like that and you think, what, why does that look like that? So, Let's have a look what we've got now. So I've put those um, extra things in there, and let's just check. Oh, it's still 512 bytes long. So that um, using those dollar signs to work out the the number of zeros to add was good. And um, just to show you as well, we've put a string in there, and you can see that here. You can see the ASCII characters in the hex editor for that hello string. So it literally just wrote the um, wrote those values of the string in there. And um, something we can check while we're doing this. I said it's good to play with things and I can't, I can't remember exactly um, if this does what I'm going to check for. I'm going to stick on the end of here uh, 6 6 and what I want to know is um, how many bytes this stores. In C when you have a string it often ends with a zero a null terminator and um, so I'm going to see my assembly whether it puts a, a zero on the end of that string or not and we'll see that it doesn't, so it doesn't write a zero on the end, so you have to do that um, manually. You don't need to worry about that just yet, but it will be important later on. So what we've seen so far, we've now we know how to um, um, to create a boot sector in assembly, and now we just need to learn a bit more about um, some assembly instructions so we can make it do something. And I said before that we're going to be printing um, a hello message to the screen soon. And, and remember, there's no operating system. We are pretty much we're behaving like the operating system there's nothing else we can use other than BIOS at this stage to do anything so I'm going to show you how we can help BIOS how we can use BIOS to help us output some information to the screen so um, well let's leave a bit of this code in there because it will be useful later on so I'm going to talk about registers now and then I'm going to talk about interrupts. Um, we need these things. But 
parts. When I put them all together, we can see it running. But um, in a processor, you've got um, the process can access memory and um, it can read and write to memory. And you, you can often you can stick loads of memory in computers these days. You know, gigabytes of it, and that's very good for storing stuff. And you know, when you you know when you're processing data, having so much memory is very good. But um, but a processor relatively to the speed of the processor accessing that main memory is very slow um, but processors have very a very small amount of very fast memory very close to them and and probably one of the fastest pieces of memory you can access is the registers and there are a few of these but the processor can use the registers to store information in to store bytes and and uh, you know words um, whilst it's working on stuff, it can store something in a register, um, add something to it, and then you know store it in another register. And you can think of them as variables for the CPU um, that you can use for doing things very quickly on. And some instructions can only operate on a on a um, on a register. So if you wanted to do something like add two numbers together, um, then you might have to store the first number into the register and then add the second number to the register value. And um, in these cases, it's just because that's how the architecture of the CPU works. And often it's because the simplicity of the, the hardware of the processor um, allows it to be very efficient and very fast. So that's why we've often got to do things like that. That's why we can't write um, you know, high level code in assembly. Anyway, let's get on with it. So, just to explain registers, I'm just going to write some assembly here, and uh, we'll just check that it compiles. So, I know that I've written um, the right instructions. The other thing with assembly is it's very difficult to remember it. Um, if you're not using it very often, which I don't, and uh, most people don't, it's very easy to forget the opcodes and stuff like that. Um, but the point is, if you understand it, then you can always come back to it. You can look up what opcodes you need. If you can understand the theory and you know how it works, the essence of it, then you can pick it up. So excuse me if I type the wrong thing, but this is how it goes. Um, so first of all, um, we have, I'll just write them as comments, but we have um, a few general purpose registers. Now there are quite a few registers and I'm only going to talk about a few of them and how they work. Later on we'll look at how the other registers work. Some registers are general purpose, um, which means they have no other use than um, just for storing information in um, whilst you're working on you know, bytes and um, calculations. Um, but other ones have special meanings. Um, they might also be general purpose registers, but they might have some other meaning. They might be modified in some way when you call a certain instruction. Um, for example, some um, some instruction decrement values in certain registers. So you do have to understand these relationships between registers and the, the CPU. And um, you know, if when you do a particular operation, it might change the value in a register. And if you've used a certain register um, by mistake, then you might find something strange happening. Um, anyway, I'm going to talk about the general purpose ones. We'll learn more about them later on anyway. But we basically got these. Um, registers AX, BX, CX, DX. There are other ones. I'm going to talk about these for now. So these are just like general purpose registers. Um, we can store values in these by doing code like this. So if I put move um, AX, 1, 2, then what this means, and these operands work in the reverse order to what you might expect. So this, what this means is, um, store this value, this literal value, inside AX. Um, yeah, so it's going to store that value in there. And if I do, um, so well, it gets more confusing when you have something like this. So let me just check that compiles. I want to make sure we're writing the, the right code. Yeah. Now if I do this, move Um, yeah, so what this is saying now is saying, remember which way around it goes, it's saying move AX, the value of AX into BX. Um, yeah, 
you can think of it when it says move you can think of it as copy really it's like copying the value it doesn't the value will stay in AX until something else changes it um, okay so we can move one register to another register and this can happen very quickly that's why we use registers um, instead of accessing memory main memory for this kind of stuff um, now just one note on these registers I'll talk about I suppose I can talk about it now, it makes sense to. When we start our computer up, it runs in um, our x86 computer, it runs in 16-bit real mode, which is a backward compatibility mode. So even though you might have a 64-bit processor or whatever, when your computer starts, it will start in 16-bit compatibility mode. So when I talk about these registers, AX and BX, um, the values they store are um, 16 bits. So they can hold two bytes. Um, later on, when we look at switching into 32-bit mode, mode, and it's similar for 64-bit extended mode, um, it just means that the aside from other other um, things that the process makes available in those modes, um, one of the things it does is it it means that we can then add together and treat numbers. Um, move data around in 16-bit or 32 or 64-bit chunks at once, so like in one instruction or in one move statement. If I wanted to move 32 bits um, or manipulate 32 bits in 16-bit mode, I have to treat it as two 16-bit values. And that's why when we add the, we basically add in the bit width to the, um, the processor, it means that we can process data much faster um, because we can handle um, larger values in fewer instructions. Okay, so we're running in 16-bit mode. So these registers hold 16-bit values. So that means I could put move CX, something like this, OX1234. Um, okay, so I can store that in CX. Let's just compile that. Uh, did I, oh yeah, so I made a mistake there, so now someone told me. So there we go, it compiled. So, um, so okay, I can store that value in there. If I put something like this, five, six, let's see what happens. Oh, it says word data exceeds bounds down here. So word is 16 bits in this case, and now I'm trying to write a value that's bigger than 16 bits. So there we go. Now, um, often when manipulating the registers, it's useful to um, also um, treat it as two 8-bit values. Um, we'll see in a minute when I look at interrupts why that is. But when you see when you see AX, it just means the the, the full 16-bit register. Now, if I put um, move DX, sorry DL. OX12. Then what this is saying, it's saying in the DX register, um, with a lower byte, um, move this value into it. And if I do the same like this, so DH, it's the same the same for the high byte. So if I put OX34, then it's saying move um, this byte, OX34, into the high. Um, the high eight bits of the um, the register, so we can treat it as separate values like that, as separate eight bit values. Um, okay, that's probably enough on register for now. We just need to know that we can use those to store values in, and we're going to show why that's important. But also, some of those registers are expected by certain bits of code, and um, like when you call a function, for example, uh, we will look at functions later, but. When you call a function in assembly, it basically amounts to jumping to an address. Um, and if you want to pass arguments to that function, then you can use registers. You can store a value in a register, like AX. And then when the, the function that's called wants to use that parameter, it knows to look in AX. Well, it doesn't know to look in AX, it expects to. So that means you need to know which registers it's going to use um, to do that. We're going to look at interrupts now, so we'll see why this is important. So, we're nearly there now, we're getting closer. Um, now, 
What we want to do, I mentioned earlier in the last lecture that BIOS is the thing that um, gives us some basic input output um, so that we can use the machine before we have an operating system. And the BIOS is implemented on a chip, um, usually and stuck in the motherboard somewhere. And um, this means that, well, we know that when the computer starts, um, we see the screen come on and we see some text on the screen usually. So we know that somehow that computer is right into the screen. And it's BIOS that enables that. Um, and we also know that BIOS can read the boot sectors from the disks, so it has some low-level um, ability to read from these different devices, or the um, the way they connect to the computer, the buses that they connect to. So we know it can do that stuff. So um, now what we're going to do is figure out how we can use BIOS to help us to print something to the screen. Now, the thing is, somewhere in BIOS, somewhere in that chip, which BIOS gets loaded into memory when the, the machine starts, so somewhere in memory there's this BIOS code that was loaded, and somewhere in that code there's a piece of um, assembly code, well machine code it will be, a piece of machine code that knows how to tell the screen to print the character. And um, so what we want to do is run that code to print the character that we choose to print. The problem is that we don't know where in memory that is. If we could find where in memory that instruction was, we could have a jump statement that jumps to it, and then it runs that code. Now, the other thing is that that code will expect, if it's going to print the character, it will expect the character to be somewhere that it can find it. And um, in this case, we'll see that it's often a register that it expects the value to be in. And um, so we'd need to store the, the, the ASCII value of the character we want to print into some register, jump to that code and run it. And then we could print something to the screen. But um, the problem is we don't know where it is. But this is where interrupts come in handy. Because um, a fundamental thing to how um, computers and operating system works is that we have this idea of an interrupt. And an interrupt just means that when we write in some code, we can we can signal an interrupt, which is just, we signal it by an index number, an interrupt number, and the computer will then switch into an interrupt state. And all that means is that it, it, it knows that somewhere in memory there was preloaded um, an interrupt table, and this is something that BIOS sets up. Um, and it registers some of its functions for like printing to the screen or reading a disk um, into the interrupt table. And the interrupt table just maps an index, an interrupt number, onto a piece of code, a handler, and then um, whenever we call that interrupt with that particular number, it's going to send the, the processor will jump to that interrupt handler, execute that code, and then it will come back to us when it's finished. Um, so this is useful because we don't need to know where in BIOS that code is. We just need to know that BIOS, thankfully for us, BIOS set up a handler um, for a particular interrupt that we do know that's well documented to print the character to the screen. OK, so we're going to do that now. Right, so let's print a character. And again, we've got, remember, we've got no operating system now, so if we can just print a single character without using an operating system, just using BIOS, then that's pretty, pretty good. It's a nice start. So, let's get rid of these things. Now, let me just say, in the, the, the machine code, the machine code, or the assembly instruction, um, to call an interrupt is this int instruction. So if I put OX10, then this will call interrupt 10. So whatever index 10 relates to in the interrupt table that was set up somewhere in memory by BIOS, then when I call interrupt 10, it's going to send the CPU um, into an interrupt state. It's going to jump to the handler. It's going to run that handler code and then come back to me. So first of all, I need to know which interrupt I want to call um, before I do anything. So I'm going to find that out. So well, I've actually got the information here in front of me. Um, but we're going to use, um, well, we're going to call interrupt 10. Okay. Um, now, the way, that, the way that the interrupts work with BIOS, the way it's set up, is that we have we have an interrupt number which relates to an index in the interrupt table. And inside the handler mapped from that particular index, BIOS has then got a, kind of like a switch statement 
um, of you can imagine it as sub handlers. So the first thing it does when it calls that um, handler for that interrupt, so interrupt 10 in this case I'm using, which is a certain in, it's, a, it's an interrupt for certain BIOS functions, and in this case it's one of them is going to let us print to the screen. So when BIOS um, when that interrupt gets called, it enters a piece of BIOS code that has a switch statement that then looks at one of the registers. Um, in this case, it's using AX register um, for another value, which then determines which subhandler it calls. So you kind of use these interrupts and the registers to select particular functions from BIOS. And again, because it's an interrupt, I don't need to worry about where that code is in memory um, because because it's mapped to in the interrupt table by BIOS already. And this is important because it means that the BIOS code can move around in memory on different, perhaps different hardware means that it has to load at a certain address. So we don't need to know where it is. Um, so I'm going to call interrupt 10. Right, if you want to find out these BIOS interrupts, you can Google on the web, you can find a, a list of, it will give you a table of all the interrupt numbers and all the register values that you need to set to call those particular functions, like to print to the screen or to do a beep or something like that. In this case, we're going to print to the screen. Let's get on. Okay, so um, this particular function that we called, and it's it's called, it's, it's a scrolling teletype BIOS routine, which just means that it will print characters. If we, if we call it, it will print a character, and if we call it again, it will print the character next to that character that we printed before. And um, this is useful. So let me just write the code and get on with it. So if I put move AL H, now what this is doing is in the in the lower um, eight bits of the AX register, it's going to move the the ASCII code for the letter H. Okay, and um, the other thing we need to do is remember I said that the handler that gets called when the interrupt 10 fires expects to know which subhandler to call and it expects to find that subhandler in AH and in this case I'm going to be using OXOE and this is the scrolling tally type so I'll put a comment in there BIOS scrolling tally type function right then what have we got here let's have a look so we're moving, we, we're selecting a particular function that we want to call in BIOS. We're passing in an argument to that function, in this case BIOS expects in AL, uh, the lower bits of the AX register, and then we're calling the interrupt for a particular set of BIOS functions. And this is going to cause our CPU to jump to there, and then hopefully this should print something to the screen, if I've not made a mistake, which is very easy to do when you're in assembly. Um, so we compiled it, that's good. Um, let's just look in our hex editor to see what it looks like. Okay, we see some bytes in there for our instructions, and we see an H there, which is the H that I put in. It's it's the correct length, so that looks good. So now we should be able to execute it. So um, we use QMU. So it's booted it, but it's not displayed a value in there. Okay, so let's just go back and check that I've got this right. So what could what could go wrong in this case? So like I said, it's easy to make mistakes. Um, okay, we've got ah. Okay, here's the first mistake. Then I've got a, a I've got a a, um, a jump endless jump before my code runs. Um, so it means that this code will never get executed. It's a good it's a good way of uh, seeing how this works. But it shows it's easy to. Um, make mistakes when writing an assembly, but it's good fun as well just to to see why you made mistakes and figure it out. So what I want to do is I want to move this jump and another way I can write this jump using the, the dollar sign just to show this is to put jump dollar which just means jump back to the, the current instruction. So this is going to give me an endless jump. So let me write a comment there so I know what that means. Now the reason I put a jump in in my boot set at the end of my code is that we don't want to we don't want to allow the computer to carry on executing all the random bytes in memory because we don't know what's going to happen. Now, okay, it might the computer might just um, fall over, um, but it is 
there is a, a, a slim chance that some of that random data could be code that, um, you know, it could call a BIOS function to say format the disk or something like this. It is possible that something like that could happen. Um, if you imagine all of that memory um, that it's going to churn through. So I put this jump, endless jump on the end of my code to make sure that I never um, escape this. It just keeps looping. So this should print something and then loop. There we go. <laughs> so that's RH. That's a nice, that's a nice um, result, really. Um, now, if you talk to most people um, and you say, I can print an H on the screen on my computer, they'll probably say, well, you know, a five-year-old kid could do that with a bit of Python code. And they could do, which is good. But the thing is, here we're running at the lowest level in the computer. There's no operating system. Um, we've not even, you know, we're just using BIOS to do the stuff. We've not got anything, to, no APIs to let us, you know, do something. No Python modules or Java modules. We're just working at the lowest level. And this is the early stage of when the computer boots. So um, we've printed an H, and that's pretty good. So that's just, um, like I said, we were going to have a function. We we're going to have some a boot sector that could say hello world. So let's just make that true and then I think our work's done I'll just, I'll just summarize this stuff but I can do that by just replicating these lines here we can be more sophisticated later on um, but I'm just going to print single charts, single characters for now. Because um, I think we've probably learned enough today. There we go. Let's compile it. And let's run it. Hey, there we go. So it says hello. And because this is the BIOS teletype function, and there are different BIOS functions for printing strings in different ways. Um, you know, like for printing at particular locations on the screen um, or in different colours and stuff like that. But this one just prints um, each character one after the other. So there we go. So we've got a boot sector that says hello. I could write that to an ISO file and I could run that. I could restart my computer with a disk in it and it would just run my code that prints hello. So this is good. Let's just check we've covered everything now. Um, yeah, so we've, we've, we've had a look at how to assemble code. Um, we saw how it's easier to do that than it is to write in the hex editor, especially because we can use labels for like to represent offsets in the file, so we don't have to remember which byte, the, the particular location of a byte in the file to jump to that particular um, code. We just have a label. Um, we also saw how we could pad it out to 512 bytes using the just a few of the assembly like symbols, like the dollar sign. Um, we looked at registers, so how, we could, how the CPU can store stuff in um, registers, general purpose registers, and we looked at interrupts and we saw how the use of registers and interrupts is a, a very um, primitive way of calling functions and that's how we call functions in BIOS. We set um, we set some expected values in registers um, that BIOS expects and then we call an interrupt. An interrupt we call with a certain number, in, in our case we used um, x decimal 10. And all that all that does is it jumps to it causes the CPU to jump to that particular index in the um, well the CPU looks up the index in the interrupt table and the interrupt table just maps that index to a, a, an address somewhere in the BIOS memory that is the start address of the BIOS code to do printing functions and in that code somewhere if we if we I mean, later on, if we write some code for printing out memory, we could search for the BIOS code in memory and print it out to see what it is. And we could probably even extract it from memory and um, and sort of disassemble it back into assembly to look at how it works. But there'll be some bit of code in there that looks a bit like a switch statement, and if, else, if, else. And it looks in the... the um, let me just check which reg it, register it was. It looks in the AH register, so that the high... 8 bits of the AX register and it uses this number to select a particular function so this is teletype and then it looks in the AL, AL the low 8 bits of the AX register for the character to print for the ASCII value so that's how it works so we call the function in BIOS and that I think 
is the end for today. So, um, so now we can write some assembly code for a boot sector. Um, next time we're going to build, we're going to learn more about assembly, and we're going to learn about things like stacks, um, and later on calling functions. And um, we're going to also look more about the CPU, how we can manipulate it to um, to do certain things. And later, much later on, we'll look at how we can switch from 16-bit mode into a 32-bit mode, or it will be similar for 64-bit mode as well, which is what the operating system has to do when it's when it's booting. Um, it wouldn't be possible. Some older operating systems, like I think I might be wrong, but I think. Um, like Windows 95, they were running 16-bit mode, and that was it. Whereas later operating systems, um, you know, Windows 2000, it would boot up into 32-bit mode, and it would run in that mode. And it's not just the it's not just the width of the bit, bits. There are like in 32-bit mode, it's got like protected memory space, so it can protect one process from another, which is specifically to help operating systems be more stable. Um, we can look at this stuff later on, but you start to understand like why. Uh, like an operating system like Windows 95 is much less stable than a, something like Windows XP and um, it's possible for one process to trample over the memory of another one by mistake so anyway more on that later but thank you very much um, I hope that was useful and um, we'll have another lecture soon okay thank you bye